looking at our theme for 2018, it is the Master's Plan for the Church. And that has been our theme since January, and this is the theme that the elders decided would be covered for this year. And so what we're doing is we're exploring the roots of the church which Christ established. And we've looked at so many different topics this past year to this point, and we're going to continue going on to December. We've looked at the anatomy of the church. We've seen uh, not only the anatomy, but also the pattern. We've seen examples uh, both in the New Testament, just as well as the, the marks of an effective congregation. Last month, we looked at the calling of the church, how we have been redeemed, and that we've been given a new identity, and now we are called with a new mission for the body of Christ. As we continue on for the next three months, the next three lessons, I want us to look at some of the structure behind a local congregation, specifically regarding to roles certain members have within the congregation. Uh, to be exact, we're going to look at the elders, the deacons, and then the preachers. And so what I want us to do just over these next three months, these next three lessons, is think about the roles as defined in Scripture. You know, as we look at perhaps this morning, there is no higher calling, no greater calling than to be an elder of a local congregation. There is certainly no greater responsibility than being an elder at a local congregation. As, as we think about the eldership this morning, not just uh, particularly Upland's eldership, but eldership across the nation, across the world, who are the elders? Who are they called to be? What is their responsibility? And then, now this is one I think we often miss. What is the responsibility of the congregation to the elders? And we may just think, well, I don't have any responsibilities. Uh, but you'll see as we read in Scripture, uh, one that Tom read this morning, we have responsibilities to our eldership, and that's something we can't take lightly. So I invite you to look with me in Titus chapter 1. As we begin this morning, as we continue on looking at God's blueprint for the church, which Christ established, which he built, which is in his name. What does God call for the eldership, for the leaders of the congregation? Well, first, let's just look at the office. Let's look at the responsibilities. As you're looking in Titus 1, I do want to call your attention on the screen to Acts chapter 14, verse 23. Because there is this important description regarding the pattern of the New Testament church, of the church of Christ. See, elders are essential for any congregation which desires to follow God's pattern. Let me say that again. An eldership is essential to any congregation that desires to follow God's plan. Amen. Now, there are a lot of congregations that do not have elderships. And, and I'm not saying that those congregations are sinful. However, there will be more discord in a congregation that does not have the spiritual leadership God has designed in his blueprint. And that's something that we can't take lightly. It seems like it would be easier if we just had uh, you know, a whole body or a whole group of individuals. And, and we had these meetings that, that did certain things. And we can try to design our own blueprint. But then guess what? That's not God's blueprint. And so as we, look, as, as we look in Titus chapter 1, I want us to first note Acts chapter 14, verse 23. This is at the end of the first missionary journey. And, and what Paul often did is he went back through the cities that he first uh, worked through. And, and the, the first uh, cities that, that he shared the gospel with. After he shared the gospel at the end of his journey, he would go back and, and strengthen the brotherhood. And then look in Acts 14, 23. And when they had appointed elders for them in how many churches? Every. Every church. Now we'll see in Titus 1, Paul called Titus to appoint elders in every town. And some think, well, maybe that's just uh, one, one group per town. Well, according to Acts 14, 23, every congregation, every church had elders. That Paul appointed. And why didn't Paul establish the eldership when he first shared the gospel? Nobody was qualified. We'll see in 1 Timothy 3 that you could not be a recent convert and be an elder. So he had to go through and share the gospel. And then at the end of his journey, he came back through. 
Now that these, these brothers were experienced, Paul could then appoint them. And here's something else that's important. Here's something that we cannot miss with the description. They were committed with prayer and fasting. Now wait a minute, fasting? When was the last time you heard about fasting in the 21st century? And we often use them as, as new fads, especially regarding uh, quick diets, overnight diets that help you lose so many pounds. Well, yeah, if you don't eat for several weeks, you're going to lose some weight. That doesn't mean it's going to be healthy. Uh, but what fasting was here in the first century was a time of complete devotion and a sign of dependency on God. So these men weren't chosen lightly. They, they took time to pray to God, asking for Him for strength, asking Him for guidance. They abstained from food and drink, making sure that their whole focus was on this one subject. And that's why it's so important for us to study and understand the role and the responsibility of the elders. Because when we read in Acts chapter 14, 23, A, there were elders in every congregation, and B, the decision was not made lightly. Now, there are three different uh, descriptions. Let me, before we continue on, uh, there are three different titles we read in the New Testament. And I'll go through these very quickly because these are not only descriptions, but, but they, they are the titles of the elders. And they help us understand the roles that the elders have. Uh, we had a class at the end of 2017 talking about the elders and the deacons and the preachers. So some of these will sound familiar first. Scripture calls these men who are in the eldership, obviously elders. But what does the term elder mean? Well, we find this term in 1 Peter 5, verse 1. And the term is probably borrowed from Judaism. In the, the Jewish society, they had a group of older men who were experienced and who were considered wise. And their sole principal responsibility was judicial. Uh, they decided between uh, disputes and discord. If, if two brothers or, or two sisters came up to the, the Jewish elders and said, hey, we have this problem. These group of men would take an account scripture and they would pray and then they would help resolve the issue. Well, we see that the eldership are the same. That it is a group of men who are experienced in their faith. And they are called to help with the interpretation of scripture with discipline and help deciding these cases. The second we read is the term bishop. You might have overseer. We read this in 1 Timothy 3, verse 1. It designates a supervisor or a manager. Of course, this is not referring to a, a secular subject, but regards to the church. In Titus 1, they're called God's steward. Verse 7, for an overseer, a bishop, as God's steward, must be above reproach. The overseer, the bishop, is an individual who has a great responsibility in leading the flock, in leading the congregation. They are to accept this with humility, accepting the responsibility that they will be held accountable in the day of judgment for their leading, for their shepherding. Which leads us to the last title. They are to be the shepherds of the congregation. And I know you've seen, we have a shepherd, a picture of a shepherd here with his sheep. And he's watching over his sheep. And this, this not only shows, you know, we often think of a supervisor, a manager, as someone who may not be that emotional. In fact, they may be detached from those they are managing. They're just making sure the business runs. And if you're not helping the business, you might be out of a job. Well, a shepherd was one who followed his sheep. He's one who spent rainy nights and humid days, hot days, taking care of his flock. That when predators came about to snatch up the sheep or thieves came in to take the sheep, he was the only source of protection for the entire flock. He slept nearby them. He knew their names. This is the example we have for the eldership. That they are called to be like the chief shepherd, to be like Jesus, who would give his own life. In fact, he gave his own life for a sheep. So we see these titles and we see these responsibilities just in the, the names alone. That what the elders are called to do is something that is great. It's something that is, has a lot of responsibility. Look with me in Titus chapter 1, beginning at verse 5. This is why I left you in Crete. So you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, 
The husband of one wife and his children are the believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. So we've already seen some of the characteristics as we're going to look at in just a minute, but I want you to notice their responsibility beginning at verse 9. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so he may be able to give instruction and in sound doctrine and rebuke those who contradict it. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for a shameful gain what they ought not teach. I want you to catch verses 9 through 11 because there are a lot of responsibilities regarding the eldership, but there are two primary ones given in chapter 1, verse 9. First, as they hold firm to the word, they must also teach the word. And this is not necessarily saying in a, a public forum, this is saying that they have the ability to discern right from wrong. You think about in this case, in this situation in the first century, they didn't have these leather-bound books containing the Old and New Testament. There was a lot of false doctrine going around at this time, especially from the Jewish party. And, and you notice that their purpose was to gain something. It wasn't for the glory of God. It was so they could fill their pockets, so they could contain control and power. And like what we saw with the shepherd and his sheep, that the shepherd had his staff as he were to deflect that the predators and the enemies, the, these animals that seek to devour the sheep, so must the elders not only teach, but rebuke false teaching. That is a great charge. That means, first of all, for you to rebuke false teaching, you must know the proper teaching. Amen. And that's exactly what Paul said to Titus. He said you have to find these men, find these individuals who can teach sound doctrine. The word sound means healthy. And the word doctrine just means teaching. The only healthy teaching comes from above, from God and through Jesus Christ, His Son. And as we were led in the first century by the Holy Spirit to, to write down what we see here in the New Testament, we have men who are called to be the leaders, to examine what the Holy Spirit taught in all truth, and then to make sure that the sheep are taken care of against that false doctrine. We do read other responsibilities, and, and I wish time would allow, but we have several other responsibilities given in Titus, 1 Timothy, 1 Peter, regarding the responsibility. It includes leading by example. It also includes praying for the sick, as we read in James chapter 5. We also see that it's also training future leaders to not only hear what God has, has said ought to be done, but also can be future elders in a congregation. Again, these responsibilities are not to be taken lightly. As we, we looked at in Hebrews 13, 17, they will one day give account for their role as elders. So this is just a, a brief overview of the office. So, so what's the model? Who, who then, if you're talking about all these responsibilities, who exactly is qualified to be an elder? And of course, the greatest model, the greatest example is the chief shepherd, Jesus the Christ. Since this is a great responsibility, we see the overriding concern in the New Testament regarding the church leadership is for the right individuals to serve as elders and as deacons. These offices are not to be given just as honorary positions to veteran faithful Christians. Well, you know, you've been serving here for a long time. Hey, we're going to make you a deacon. Hey, you know, you've been a deacon. Hey, we're going to make you an elder. That, that's not how this, this is to go about. That there are certain individuals who are qualified, and then there are certain individuals who are not qualified. Amen. And we must know the difference. Amen. These are to be filled. These positions are to be filled by men who look to the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. And here's why. You can look at any example in history. You can look at secular. You can look at religious. Wherever the leaders go, people follow. We look at biblical examples. Biblical history demonstrates that people will seldom rise above the spiritual level of their eldership. That's just the truth or of their leadership. 
When God gave certain qualifications in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus 1, these were traits, these were qualities that, for the most part, every Christian ought to have. And we can say, well, you know, what about being married or having children? Those, those are only the, the few exemptions. But if we are married, it's to be one spouse. If we do have children, then they ought to be believers. See, we can look at these qualifications and we say, well, you know, brother so-and-so, he's not doing these things. He's not... Are we doing these things? Mm -hmm. Are we looking to these traits and saying, you know, God, if this is what God wants out of a leader, why wouldn't God want that out of me? Right. See, as Paul said, imitate me just like I imitate Christ. When we imitate godly men who fit these qualifications, we're also imitating the chief shepherd. So as we look at 1 Timothy 3, in Titus 1, we see these qualities of an elder. i got to be honest with you, there are 20 different traits, at least 20. We don't have time to go into 20. Uh, we, we really don't have time to go into about five of them. While we can't delve into every quality in depth, we do need to emphasize two important factors regarding the qualities of, of an elder. First, if you were to take... 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, you look at these 20 different traits. A lot of them overlap. And then you were to list them in one column. And then in another column, you were to list the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. You will see a lot of similarities. In fact, you will notice out of the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, most of those are things that elders are prohibited from doing. They're prohibited from acting in certain ways. And then if you look at the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, these are certain traits and qualities that the eldership is supposed to embrace. That they're called to walk in step with the Spirit and not give in to the, the works of the flesh. Secondly, if we were to take these 20 traits and we were to separate them and categorize them, we'd have six different categories. And let me give it to you. They're here on the screen. It's all about character. Who the person is outside and inside the church. You look at his leadership. You see how he leads by example. You see not only his character, but does he have the ability, the capacity to lead. You look at his home life. And this, is, this seems somewhat invasive and aggressive. And it seems personal, but it is. Because as we read in 1 Timothy 3, A... This is a noble task. This is a noble work. And B, we see that if he is not able to lead his household, how we take care of God's church. We see his reputation. His reputation is important outside as well as the inside. Now, that doesn't mean that people won't try to stir up gossip or stir up false truths, that, that they're not really correct. But on the surface, they seem accurate because First Peter talks about how people were shaming Christians for their faith. But these men who are to be elders ought to have a good reputation in and outside of the congregation. Amen. They're to have a proper service. That they're not only ones who manage and supervise, but they also get their hands dirty. They're also willing to work alongside, like I said, be an example of their faith. And finally, the last category of these 20 traits is their faith. You look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. He must not be a recent convert. See, he is one who has developed his faith, matured his faith. As we saw in James chapter 5, when there's an individual who is struggling, either with a physical illness or a spiritual one, they're the first turn to their eldership, to this group of men, who are willing to help lead them back to the truth and to pray for them. And here's something else we need to know. An elder will never be perfect in regard to being sinless. Amen. However, he is to be one who can set the example of rejecting the flesh and walking in step with the Spirit. There's a lot that we've laid out here in just a few minutes. And we, like I said, we don't have time to look at all these different passages and, 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 and closely examine them. It would take us a series of classes to fully see these qualifications and these responsibilities. But we must have in mind, as we talk about God's blueprint, we can't talk about God's blueprint without looking at the leadership of God's local congregation. <coughs> so we've seen the elders, the bishops, overseers, 
the shepherd. So you might hear the word pastor. That's just another word for shepherd. Honestly, I, I'm not a pastor. I'm a minister. I'm a preacher. But I don't, I'm not, I don't fit the qualifications to be a pastor, to be a shepherd. But I cannot, I cannot end this lesson this morning without talking about one more important fact. We as a congregation have a great responsibility to our elders. Now you look at that sheep and you think, what, what responsibility could that sheep ever have? And I think, you know, sometimes we might feel that way. Well, hold on, I'm just, I'm just sitting over here in this pew. I'm just a sheep. I don't have a responsibility to anybody. That's, that's the elder's job. That's the elder's work. Is that really what Scripture calls our attitude to be? In fact, when you look at, when you examine the New Testament text, we have just as many responsibilities, just as many traits we're called to live out as the elders do. You don't believe me? Well, let's look together. There are at least three I want us to look at this morning, and our time will be over. I want us to check out 1 Thessalonians 5, Hebrews 13, 1 Peter 5. You think that's a lot of passages. I can't turn that fast. Well, that's okay. Because I, lift, I, I lifted the key words out of the passage. I put them on the screen. So as I read, I want you to hear these words. This is how we as members of the body ought to treat our leaders in the faith. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13. We ask you brothers to, what's that word? What's the first word? Respect. Respect, Respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. It's very hard sometimes to respect someone who's admonishing you. That means correcting you. Disciplining you, but guess what? We are called to respect our elders. Well, he hasn't done anything worth my respect. You know, we, we might have that attitude. That means we are having a pride issue. Yeah. And we're not willing to be humble and seeing what these men have to deal with day in and day out. We're aiming to be respectful. Be aware to esteem them. That means to lift them up. And we're to do it very highly in love. Having love for these brothers who work so hard to serve the congregation. Finally, I love this part of 1 Thessalonians 5. Be at peace among yourselves. We will never grow as a congregation, and we will never make an impact in the community unless we are first at peace among ourselves. Amen. It will not happen. Because when people see us in the community, and we're divisive, we're quarreling, we're gossiping, we're back-talking, what kind of image does that set about Christ? What does that teach them about our faith? That it's shallow, if it's even present. Hebrews chapter 13. Now this is going to be a little bit more difficult. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they're keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning. For that would be of no advantage to you. So I want you to catch that there are two words here that sound similar, but there are distinctions. One, we are to obey. That means if I have a disagreement, you know what that tells me? I still need to obey. The, the passage doesn't say obey until you disagree and then you go about your own way. It says A, obey, and B, submit. There's a difference between obeying and submitting, and the best way I can think about it is if you're a parent and you have a young child, you say, go clean your room. I don't want to clean my room. I'm telling you to go clean your room. So they, and they go clean their room. Well, they might have obeyed you. They didn't submit to you out of love. And they didn't make your job as being a parent a joyous one. In fact, I'm sure a lot of your kids have made you groan over the years. We should make this job easier for our leaders, not harder. We should submit and help them have this, this experience with joy. So many elders and deacons become so burned out by these responsibilities that they can no longer serve the capacity they used to. We have to make this job a blessing to them and not a curse. One more passage. I know our time is about up. 1 Peter 5, verse 5. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. This passage calls for elders to be humble. It also calls for every member to be humble. 
We cannot be at peace among ourselves. We cannot submit ourselves. We cannot obey. We cannot make this, this job a blessing unless we are first humble. We need to show a dependency on Christ and demonstrate that I may not know the best path, the best way. And there are a lot of other passages we can look at, specifically 1 Timothy 5, about giving honor where honor is due. As well as if we have a charge against the elders that we have concrete evidence with two or three other members. That we don't just go about attacking, defaming, besmirching, or gossiping about our leaders. That, that we help build them up. We need to be humble and peaceful, even if we degree, disagree with the decision that they make. Because maybe, just maybe, they know about a situation more than we do. This is all about trust. This is all about this mutual understanding that we are all to serve Christ together. The elders are called with a great responsibility not to lord over a congregation, but to set the example. The congregation is called not to attack or make the job a burden, but to make it a joy. This is God's plan. God had a great design in establishing an eldership for every congregation. It isn't A, a one-man job, and B, it's not for a beginner Christian. There are a lot of tasks, a lot of problems to solve, a lot of responsibilities to take, and Christians are called to support the leadership in undertaking this ability, this responsibility. This particular congregation, I'm, I'm so thankful to serve because we do have a group of men who are transparent, who love serving, and who are willing to set the example. We need to make sure that we help support them as they continue leading us. And we need to make sure that we are all surrounding ourselves with the love of Christ, clothing ourselves in humility, and making sure that what we're doing is all part of the master plan. The master has a plan for his church. And as I ask this every single time we talk about this subject, are you a part of the are you following God's footsteps as He leads us day in and day out? That through the Holy Spirit we have access to God's mind, His Spirit, His truth. Are we willing to open it up and see what He has to say to us? Are we willing to help those who watch over us, to pray for them, and to serve with them? As we continue on looking at deacons and ministers, as we continue out throughout this series, we have to ask ourselves, am I really a part of the plan Jesus has set for me? Part of that plan includes salvation. That I have this great blessing in God through Jesus Christ, that although I was a sinner, that Jesus has set me free. And that he offers this freedom, he offers this salvation to every single person on this planet. All I have to do is turn to him, submit to him, and obey his will. Are you able, are you willing to have that faith in Jesus Christ? Are you willing to be baptized, have your sins washed away? If you are a child of God and you realize, I haven't really been following the plan the way God has called me to. Maybe you have sin in your life. Maybe you're, you're suffering from temptations and you're not sure you can hold out. Maybe you just have a burden on your heart and, you, and you're just saying to yourself, I can't hold on to this anymore. Turn it over to the congregation. Turn it over to the eldership. Most importantly, turn it over to God. Let us pray with you. Let us be there for you so that no one has to face this trouble alone. If you need anything at all, come now. Always stand.